I'm really excited to talk a little bit about some ongoing work that I've been doing uh, for the past several years um, on L3Cs. And one of the first things you're probably asking yourself is, what is an L3C? And there's a reason I use the acronym or the nickname as opposed to its long form name, not only because it's cumbersome to say the long form name, but because it's also a bit of, in my opinion, a misnomer. The L3C stands for Low Profit Limited Liability Company. And this organizational form uh, mirrors what you see in terms of a, an LLC, a limited liability company, that limits um, the owner's liability, uh, briefly, um, but that the L3C is expressly intended for educational or charitable purposes. So when I use this term actualizing hybridity, it's because in the course of my interviews and some survey work that I've done, and working hands-on with some early stage L3Cs, that this is one of the buzzwords that really pops up, is that they are taking the best of the private, commercial, business sector and melding that with a social purpose, or in another way, the best of the nonprofit sector. But they're doing it under one umbrella, as opposed to any sort of a collaboration or some sort of a contractual agreement, they are making this happen under the auspices of one organization. So as we actualize this organizational hybridity, it's really more than anything a fancy title, uh, as I've tried to push through this work and, and being in the early stages of this work, um, it's also some of the first that has really tried to employ the use of some data. Um, actually, I just looked at Alex, who has actually done quite good work in this area, especially with L3Cs in North Carolina. Um, which has an interesting story in terms of the progression of where we see this story headed. So there is a promise there, there is a peril there, and hopefully today as I kind of give you a snapshot of some of the work that I've been doing, uh, we'll see whether or not that potential is one that can be realized. Okay. So definitional purposes, what is an L3C? Okay. It is a non-corporate form of doing business that limits owner's liability, just like the definition I gave you earlier. So it's not uh, like a C corporation or an S corporation. It is much more focused and centered around um, some member management as well. So flexibility in operations through participation and management. Whereas in some corporate forms, or specifically for the social side, the nonprofit organizations, there is not as much of a divide between a board of directors and those who carry out the day-to-day -day operations of a nonprofit organization. That is, people who could be on the board are also involved in the management. So sometimes in L3Cs, we will see a much smaller board that has dual roles and is not necessarily um, separate as an entity. Um, it exists solely for charitable or educational purposes. And this definition is becoming potentially slowly outdated. Um, in some states where legislation has been a little bit more progressive, such as Illinois. Um, the founder of the L3C, his name is Robert Lang, with the Americans for Community Development, um, has requested that, that his, his L3C, the idea of an L3C, remain sort of untouched. He likes it as is, but there are other people out there who feel that there is opportunity to expand on this idea of what an L3C is and that is that it can be expanded a little bit more. When you talk about charitable or educational purposes, that is somewhat broad. And in, with my own students, one of the examples I give is uh, an L3C that was sort of a, a, a forerunner of L3Cs is a motorcycle uh, riding school in Vermont for women, right? Very specific. And oftentimes I'll get some chuckles because they're like, well, educational, sure, I can see that. We want all of our motorcycle riders to be safe. We would like some gender equity, some parity here. So I, I can see how that could be an L3C. But some people don't see the value in that, right? And so um, sort of distilling charitable and educational purposes has become a challenge for some because it is so wide. But in Illinois, um, a colleague of mine, Mark Lane, is seeking to expand that by creating um, a more widespread net, so to say, um, for these organizations. So. Despite the fact that they are, in fact, for lack of better words, businesses, uh, they can't have any purpose to produce, a significant purpose to produce income or property appreciation. Um, but they can produce significant income or property appreciation. I know that sounds 
kind of odd and almost contradictory, but I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second. One of the things that is often touted about L3Cs is that the proprietors can solicit program-related investments. Are, are most of us pretty familiar with PRIs in the room? Okay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And they really like to think that that is something that distinguishes them, that sets them apart, although if you're familiar with PRIs, um, it, it, it's, they're not necessarily organizationally bound. As long as you fit the parameters for that investment with an educational or charitable purpose, you can solicit a PRI. Okay. And lastly, um, there is no political or legislative purpose, like a 501c4, for example, that does have purposes like that. Uh, you cannot advocate for political gain here. So I know this is probably going to be a little bit difficult to see. Um, I'm more than happy to circulate this if anybody's interested. And I do have uh, another paper that I'm putting out. Um, it's not quite finished, but getting close. But this is a, a chart that shows some of the L3C legislation that has come about since its inception. Um, and you can see, for the most part, uh, in terms of the chambers where um, the votes are cast for these laws that it gets some pretty widespread recognition. So Illinois uh, has always been pretty forward thinking with regard to organizations such as this. Um, so I mean, it was a, a very uh, clean and easy vote. Um, Louisiana, uh, a couple of these states I don't have vote tallies for, Michigan, North Carolina, um, Rhode Island, Utah, Vermont, Wyoming, uh, Puerto Rico just approved it at the end of last year. Um, and then three Indian nations, the Oglala Sioux, Crow Nation, and the Navajo Nation, uh, have all approved L3C legislation within their jurisdictions. Um, the Navajo Nation was sort of interesting in that when they approved theirs in 2014, it was actually an approval after the president of the Navajo Nation vetoed the original legislation. And part of the reason he vetoed the legislation was North Carolina repealed their law in 2013 which was sort of interesting, and Alex can probably uh, comment a little bit more on that, only because, um, were you still there when that happened? Yeah, so I mean, that was an interesting political issue that came up in that it was one of the first jurisdictions to repeal its law. Uh, so far, uh, to my knowledge, no others have repealed the law, but, um, and despite the fact that legislation has continued to move forward, we are not seeing the sort of rapid ascension of these legal structures as we might with the concomitant rise of its similar organization, the Benefit Corporation. Okay, so a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with B-Lab and how they started certifying um, companies to say, you know, they, they've passed muster with us, they've at least scored 80 out of 200 of our assessment, and we're gonna put our seal of approval, the big B with a circle around it, for lack of better words, a better business bureau for um, socially responsible organizations. But they too, in Maryland, started introducing legislation to create this benefit corporation, which was a legal structure. And very near that, the L3C came about. So some people say, well, why don't you do something comparative? Why don't you also talk about benefit corporations? And as I was telling Richard earlier, part of the reason I like L3Cs is because they're a little bit messier, right? There's a little bit, there's something there that is enticing about the fact that the organization uh, and, and the coalition of ideas around how to best help the L3C survive um, or, or flourish isn't there. The, the, the backing, the branding, uh, the money, the mobilization that you see through B-Lab and the Benefit Corporation um, seems to be a pretty well-oiled machine, whereas this still has some kinks to be worked out. And that has provided for me some very uh, interesting and curious research questions. So uh, I mentioned earlier about the fact that they can solicit program-related investments, okay? And just as a, a bit of a refresher in terms of what those PRIs are, um, Mark Lane, who I referenced earlier, wrote in a recent book that foundations are able to invest rather than merely grant, thereby capturing the financial and social multiplier effect of an investment made for social purposes that can be recovered, and therefore, akin to you know, your microfinancing and your micro lending with things like Kiva, right? You can give $25 to a cattle raiser in Azerbaijan and eventually you recoup that with zero interest. PRIs try to use that same mechanism, either at very little interest or no interest, okay? 
Um, so that is something that they like to, to say, hey, we, we've got a mechanism in place here. Okay. So in terms of PRIs, there's the so-called 5% rule, right? Wherein uh, foundations can either make grants from 5% of non-charitable use assets to charitable causes, okay? Or they can contribute to a PRI um, from 5% of their non-charitable use assets to charitable causes, okay? And lots of foundations, um, specifically you'll see a lot of your larger foundations like MacArthur, Ford, that have very healthy uh, PRI portfolios, but even smaller ones, including in Denver where I am, uh, and this often confuses people, but the Gates Family Foundation, not Bill and Melinda Gates, but the Gates Family that were um, part of Denver's oil boom and construction, and I believe they were also in other materials, has a family foundation. I can actually look right from my office into their boardroom, and they have a PRI portfolio, um, which is really exciting to me because as you see the advent of these organizations, um, my concern, and, and this is something that I'll get to as well, is when you're looking at making a, a large financial investment, okay, uh, a, a, a big PRI to get involved in, so I'm going to toss this question out to you to think about it for a minute. Do you really want to invest in a legal structure that has the words low profit in it? It's something to think about, okay? So with regard to these PRIs, um, just to give you a little bit more context as to what they are. Uh, they can be um, made through venture capital and other high-risk investments that would otherwise subject foundation and its manager to 10% jeopardizing investment excise tax. Uh, the primary purpose has to be charitable, and this does have a bit more of an expanded role in terms of what that can be. So religious organizations, <coughs> scientific, literary, or educational, amateur sports leagues, preventing cruelty to children or animals, Right, so you'd think that you know it's not necessarily items that are mutually exclusive, but um, you can see what qualifies under that charitable purpose. Okay, so again, um, you know, income production or property appreciation is not a significant purpose, but you can still get a lot of money if that happens. Um, the purpose is not to attempt to influence legislation. Again, no advocacy can be undertaken. You cannot contribute to a political campaign or an office. So there are a lot of different ways in which you can carry out these PRIs, um, interest-free or below market rate loans, um, deposits in community development banks, and we've seen where that's been successful. In some cases, we've seen where it hasn't been successful. Again, pointing to Chicago, uh, where I did some work prior to moving to my current institution, uh, Shore Bank was uh, an example of a community bank that unfortunately did not succeed as we had hoped. Uh, equity investments and leases are also other ways in which you can make PRIs. So uh, I won't get into too many details because I don't want to shift uh, too much from the L3C mechanism, but I want to you know, make sure that you understand why PRIs are so important. Uh, but these are some various examples um, of PRIs that have been made, including uh, low interest loans to needy students, uh, direct investments in businesses which create jobs, investments in land conservation or brownfields mitigation. So a lot of different examples. Um, and you can see that it, that it does in fact cast a wide net and is very, um, has been successful in many cases. Um, some history of PRIs. And this is where uh, something that I find very interesting. I, I wish that within my sort of subfield of, of nonprofit management um, and even social innovation a little bit writ larger that we would have some more work done on PRIs because I find that they're quite fascinating. Um, so they're not entirely new. I realize that the uh, White House Office of uh, Social Innovation and Civic Participation has sort of taken a renewed interest in PRIs because they're sort of retooling how they're able to be used. Um, but they're not new. Um, 1968, the Ford Foundation granted the Nature Conservancy a uh, six million dollar line of credit for some of their programs in upstate New York. And that was the first program related investment. Um, and a few years later, the Ford Foundation put a white paper out and they basically said, you know, this is a, a very important line right here, that a million dollars invested in a PRI is basically the equivalent of five million dollars in grant expenditures. Which seems to be a pretty big impact for a far smaller price tag, right? And some of that, I would assume, and again, there hasn't been a whole lot of work done to this, and this is just anecdotal evidence, 
not even evidence, but just an assumption that some of these organizations are probably figuring if I've got a million dollar loan, I'm obviously going to be a little bit more accountable if I have to pay these funds back, as opposed to, oh, we can breathe easily, we've got $5 million at our disposal, right? So really being a lot more strategic with the funds where they've been going, okay? And Ford actually has uh, a handful of white papers, at least two that I've drawn from, that, that talk about PRIs. I know there have been some white papers out of Indiana University, and um, the communitywealth.org site is also a, a great tool for people who um, are looking to learn more about this. Um, I'm sure this number has grown even more than 500 million at this point in time, but Ford has committed 500 million to PRIs, and they maintain an annual commitment to at least 25 million. And then from 86 to 2009, MacArthur in Chicago uh, awarded PRIs totaling 377 million to over 200 recipients in the US and beyond. So, as much as we focus on the, the charitable sector, right, or giving and philanthropy, sometimes we don't realize that part of this comes through a mechanism such as a loan, right? We feel that we're, we're trying to achieve social good and we don't realize that there are some transactions, commercial transactions, profit seeking, things like that that happen that do achieve the social good, right? And so as someone that researches in this realm of social innovation, I've, <laughs> Not to sound that I'm not being an objective scholar, but I've been on somewhat of a crusade to exonerate profit so that a lot of my colleagues who've been in this realm of, of nonprofits in general who think that, you know, profit is a dirty word. You talk about filthy lucre. You know, in, in, in certain languages, you know, Italian and Spanish, the word lucro is actually ingrained in the definition of what a nonprofit organization is. And I realize that we have plenty of examples that show us that there are you know, corporations that have not done what they should. We can mention certain Wall Street organizations, but I do believe that with good intent and good oversight and accountability, that this mechanism can be a positive one, okay? So, why am I showing you this picture? Even though I said 1968 was the first PRI, <laughs> Ben Franklin was issuing little PRIs in Philadelphia a long time ago, right? Our founding father, uh, one of them, was granting money to various businesses, and whether or not they had social value, I mean, that's obviously debatable, but uh, this guy did a lot of things. And I can say, or at least the Ford Foundation says that he is someone who contributed early on to um, the ability to, to finance mechanisms and then pay back loans for social benefit. So what have I done in this regard? Okay, so as we turn back to sort of L3Cs, bringing this hybrid organization back together. What have we learned from its inception? Where is it going? Is it going anywhere? Is it gonna falter, okay? We've now seen one jurisdiction roll its law back, and I don't know what's gonna to happen to others. Uh, legislation has languished. Um, and it's been tough because we've had competition from other uh, types of legal formats, such as the benefit corporation. For example, California does not have L3Cs, but you do have flexible purpose corporations, right? Which is, is essentially a benefit corporation. So I've been trying to figure out a way in which we can better understand what these organizations are, what they're trying to achieve, and where we can go with them, okay? And for the most part, in any research that has been done, the L3Cs have largely been under the purview of legal scholars, right? Which comes out a little bit differently than we as social scientists might undertake some research. They, they analyze the laws, they write footnotes to footnotes, no disrespect to legal scholars, but in order to, to get a better understanding, I just wanted to talk to people, okay? So while I was still in Chicago, I, did, uh, I conducted 36 semi-structured interviews with L L3C proprietors in both the Chicago area and some in Michigan to get a bit of variety that were in business for at least two years or more, and I did some Q-sorts, which is a sort of a fun methodology that kind of is like a, a factor analysis to really kind of hone in on certain areas. And I did a content analysis of intake forms um, from an L3, L3C consultant that I work with in Colorado. I actually started working with him. His name is Rick Zwetsch. Um, he operates a small firm in Longmont, Colorado called Intersector Partners, and it is a registered L3C. Uh, Rick is a great guy and he does a running tally of the number of L3Cs that uh, are currently operating in the country. 
And he was gracious enough to hand off some of his intake forms saying, there's data here, I'm sure there's something. I don't know what to do with them. Can you please do something for me? And I'm like, <laughs> you're talking to a, a tenure track junior professor and you're giving me data? Of course I can do something with it or I'll die trying. Um, and then beyond that, I developed uh, a, a national survey and I'm trying to put forward uh, another one. It was supposed to go out at the end of last year, um, but you know, what do they say? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, so it's a little bit uh, late, but I'm hopefully going to get that out soon enough. Okay, so I wanna give you today a bit of a snapshot of what I see and then sort of wrap up with where uh, I would like to see things go. Um, so these, these interviews that I did with L3C proprietors were a lot of fun. Uh, only because when you sit down and you talk to people about their intentions or when you want to find out information from them, uh, it's fun to see people's reactions. And so I wanted to, to display some representative quotes from these interviews that I did. And um, I think I'm, I've got a good spectrum here of people who are pretty positive and, and, and moving across the board. There is some variety. So this first one, she said, for me, it is about being distinct. I want people to look at the L3C after our name and ask what it means. It enhances their awareness while demonstrating that we're socially conscious. We are a business, we don't hide from that, but we are a socially conscious one and it's important to promote that. So the next one says, more than anything, it distinctly fits what we wanted to do. At first, we incorporated as a 501c3 public charity and things were okay for a short while, but the governance structure and our need for capital were always conflicted. This model gives us flexibility, but I'll also acknowledge that it gives us a set of new challenges. Okay. So um, when I'm in a classroom setting, I often get students who say, I wanna start a nonprofit organization. And that's when I crush their dreams. <laughs> And I say, <laughs> work in a nonprofit organization first, right? Get your inside information, learn the operations, learn the pitfalls, learn the high points, do what you can. And, you know, needs assessment, SWOT analysis, whatever you need to do to, to make sure that you're filling a certain niche, right? Um, and some of these folks that I talked to were, were pretty open about the fact that they did not fully explore or vet this type of organization before they jumped into it. And as I started pushing out my surveys, both online and in paper, uh, it was disheartening to get a lot of those surveys back <laughs> as non-deliverable, which signified to me that perhaps they had folded a little bit too soon. Um, third one. So now the picture starts to look a little bit more grim, right? And bear in mind, all of these organizations were in business at the same time. To my knowledge, at least three of them still are. This individual said, I've gotta be honest here. I don't know. The more I look at us, I don't see the whole social purpose or mission thing. It was new and different, that was the draw, but I don't know that we'll last like this in our current form. This is a coffee shop, okay? Um, I am also, in addition to, to some of these things, very interested in work integration social enterprises, or WISES, right? And that term seems to be a little bit more common in Europe, but we have started to explore them a lot more here but it's not a foreign concept. Um, if any of you have ever made a donation to a Goodwill drop-off center, many of the individuals that are helping you are folks that are in some sort of a, a work program. And I think that those programs are noble. And um, this particular coffee shop was trying to do that. But they were experiencing some difficulty in terms of their model, the way they hired, the way they were able to pay. And I saw a lot of frustration on this proprietor's face uh, with regard to wanting to do something good for individuals, but at the same time, not being able to be a profitable business. And so I, I think that he felt that it was something um, more challenging. As the previous quote mentioned, there were a, a set of challenges in addition to the opportunities. So this individual is funny. Well, it's simple enough for me, you know, it's a social investment thing, business with a mission, that simple. But I don't know about these others, you know, I think maybe half of the orgs that are L3C should be. The other half don't know what they want. I mean, look at so-and-so. They build themselves as a not-for-profit, but they display their L3C tag loud and proud. They don't get it. And I look at this, the, the, the referenced masked um, organization and on their website, it in fact had their name comma L3C, as, it, as many states stipulate that it has to be shown. 
and underneath it it said a registered Illinois charity. Well, it's not technically a charity, and I'm being pedantic and splitting hairs a little bit, but uh, you know, when you're talking what is a registered public charity versus a you know, non-corporate legal entity, uh, it piques the interest of, of individuals like me. And so uh, rather than really focusing more on, on what they were, uh, this individual deflected a little bit and said, there are a lot of L3Cs out there that probably shouldn't be. I'll show you the last one here that, again, focuses on PRIs. And this uh, speaks a little bit to something I said earlier. It said, sure, we can obtain PRIs, but that's not an organizationally bound function. Anyone technically can get a PRI if it fits the educational or charitable mission, but ask yourself if large foundations are going to make loans to organizations with the words low profit in the legal structure. To my knowledge, only masked, it's an organization called CEDAR. I don't think they would mind if I mentioned that, has received one. We have a lot of work to do in terms of legitimating ourselves, which is a valid concern, right? So if you're going to sort of position yourself to the ability to get capital through these program-related investments, I think there are people who are sort of in the PR, P, sorry, L3C business who are saying if we don't start to get these PRIs and see some success there, we are not going to be able to legitimately exist within the social innovation and social enterprise realm. Okay. So I did some cue sorts. Um, I gave individuals a number of statements on cards, kind of played a little game with them, sat across from them after I interviewed them, and said, in terms of where you see the functionality of the L3C, could you please organize these cards in terms of, of level imp of importance to you? And I basically categorized them into these three um, categories, so I, I didn't want to show you all of the statements because that would be cumbersome to read, but grouping these, the first order was always social or educational value, which again, I realized there might be some validity issues there because if you're in the social or educational um, business, of course you want to postulate that that's the contribution you're making, okay? So 27 of the individuals, or 75%, said that was their first priority. And then next was revenue generation or profit. And then the third was identity or branding. Okay. Which, again, uh, with sort of the, the comparison group, which I'm not talking about, um, but because people always bring up benefit corporations, those are other things that, that come up when, when they talk about that as well. Um, and if you're interested, I can be um, more than happy to give you the full list of questions I asked and the sorts that came out, because there is a little bit more variation. And so as I moved on and plugged through the analysis and kept going and trying to figure out, you know, where, where is this going? Are we getting towards more of a, a, an understanding of where these L3Cs are? Um, so first and foremost, of the 56 forms that I took, there were between 20 and 30 items on each form. Uh, not every single item was responded to because it may not have pertained to the individual that was seeking to make an entree into this realm. But all of the forms noted that a financial planner and attorney would best suit them in preparing to start an L3C. Makes sense, okay? Half of them were from states without L3C laws. Okay, so in that initial chart that I showed you of the dozen or so jurisdictions that have them, one of the questions that I often get is, how can you be an L3C if you don't have the legal structure in your state? It's possible, it just doesn't seem like it would be a very fun procedure. Okay, so I mentioned to you that Rick, um, my colleague in Colorado, uh, operates his business, his consulting firm is an L3C. I believe he registered in Vermont, which was the first state to approve them. Okay, so you can register in the state and then when you go back to your own jurisdiction, you just have to register as a foreign entity. Okay, um, so it is possible. Um, you just really have to wanna do it, I guess. Uh, slightly over the half, <coughs> Uh, Mark, 52% of the proprietor's immediate past work was in the private sector, okay? So we've, we've seen this a lot. This is nothing novel where people who have, you know, amassed wealth have said, you know, I'm good now, I want to help people. Um, and that's kind of how it happened with B-Lab, right? Um, they, if you're familiar with the And One brand of clothing, um, I know I am because growing up as a poor kid in Arizona, I always wanted the Air Jordan basketball shorts, but mom and dad could afford Walmart brand and one shorts, right? So I'm well acquainted with them. The founders of and one started, you know, B-Lab and, 
and that was their shift. It was, we're going from where we went to make our money, and now we want to make our imprint in the social sector. So half of these proprietors' uh, experience was all in the private sector. The other half was mixed between nonprofit and a handful of government. Okay. Um, and then the breakdown in terms of where they wanted to go with their L3C once in operation. Um, the, you'll see the percentages and the raw numbers there in terms of social services, education, uh, employment or job training. Uh, there was at least one sports league and then there were a couple of technology focused L3Cs that were educationally oriented but taking technology into uh, the hands of, of those that are at or below the poverty line or working with children uh, doing adaptive learning, things of that nature. Um, and then, uh, again, I was, the contributions that, that the legal scholars have made have been great. They've definitely enhanced my understanding. They've also given me a host of new questions, and they've also just really puzzled me as well uh, in terms of is there a there there with this. So I thought, talk to people in detail. So in addition to the interviews that I did where I sat down with these proprietors and to the client intake forms of people who wanted to start an L3C, I thought, well, let's do something writ a little bit largely, uh, more large, um, in terms of L3Cs. So we identified approximately 800 across the country that we um, took a, a sample from uh, a larger universe, and we crafted, I say we, my research assistants and myself, uh, crafted a survey that focused, focused on these areas. So we looked at organizational structure, and these are just sample questions. And if you'd like a copy of the survey, I'm more than happy to distribute that as well, especially as we try to uh, launch a new iteration and try to improve it. I'm sure there could be a lot of improvements made on it. So, you know, asking, was your L3C previously structured in another type of organizational form? You know, it, it, what, was it a business and it didn't fit your needs, or is this a new venture that you're starting from scratch? And if so, why aren't you doing a traditional LLC? A lot of the reasons that some of the legislation that seems to be failing in states is because a lot of lawmakers are saying, we don't need this. It's, it's adding to our already burdensome unfunded mandates, right, of we're going to create a law, this is going to happen, but we're not going to provide any mechanism for you to pay for it, okay? So, you know, L3C legislation has, has failed in Colorado, it's failed in Arizona, but we've seen benefit corporation um, legislation have success. Um, so in addition to the organizational structure, um, we detailed questions on management and personnel, um, who sets the strategic goals for your organization, again, because it can be a member-managed organization. Uh, do you have more input from people on your board or is it more focused on the actual proprietor who started the organization, the owner, so to say? Deciding on the model, um, which plays off the organizational structure, the purpose and the mission. Again, part of the reason we want to ask these questions is to show, or at least try to show, uh, or see whether or not we are using this as, as window dressing, right? It wouldn't be completely beyond the pale to see um, people using the good nature of customers uh, or consumers to make money, right? We see it in cause marketing, we've seen it in other realms. So we wanna make sure that, that people are doing it for the right reasons, or at least see what to them uh, are the right reasons. Your community and networks. So have you found nonprofit or for-profit organizations more receptive to your business model? There is a little bit of dissension in, in the social sector within these types of organizations. But beyond that, we also want to know who they're networked to. Are you networked to a good you know, giving circle or a community of donors? Are you networked to the philanthropic sector and to large foundations that could potentially grant your ideas these PRIs that other um, L3Cs like to tout? Funding, what percentage of your revenue is received from private foundations? I can tell you right now that question was not well responded to, but at least gave us a, a bit of a snapshot to see you know, what kind of funding they are actually getting. I would say roughly half of the actual number that we got to participate did provide uh, a number, and it varied greatly from uh, in the hundreds to the um, hundreds of thousands. Um, and then assessment and accountability, does your L3C use a third-party standard in evaluating its social impact? 
And there are a number of these that exist currently, such as B-Lab's uh, mechanism for accounting, uh, IRIS, and other impact investment things. Yes, Gary. Um, did you ask some of these questions using my structured interview as well? You haven't reported us. But, but. I, I did do some of them, and some I didn't. Uh, I think in part because those semi-structured interviews really sort of led into the survey. Um, but I do think that it would be useful to maybe even take the survey and sit down with people as opposed to just having them fill it out. Um, but, I mean, to give you a snapshot of what some of these sample questions got back, and I apologize if that's a little off, but the blue um, is just showing some summary statistics. So, for example, was your L3C previously organized in another type of organizational form? Uh, half of them were not. Oh, no, I'm sorry. 50 of those that, that came in were not previously organized as an, uh, as an other organizational form. I should reel this back a little bit. So originally, we had sent out 800 surveys, got over half of them back. And so we considered that a pilot. And then when we sent out the second wave, uh, we got back roughly 72. So we have about 70 to 72, depending on how many people answered. Uh, organizational level responses to this. So a very small N, which is why we're doing it again, because if we did just one cut, it really wouldn't serve us. So if we get something else out, hopefully we can capture a lot more of the um, L3Cs that exist out there. So 82% of them were not previously organized as another form. So again, that, that curiosity of, are you shifting because the other organizational form didn't fit your needs, or is this just some newfangled idea that you think is really going to change the world, right? So who sets the strategic goals for your organization? Um, just over half of them, or 31, are member managed. So it does seem to be sort of a coalition leadership. Um, what other legal forms of organization did you consider when organizing your L3C? 57% um, considered LLCs, 48% considered 501c3 public charities. Which is, to me, so interesting to see such a split, right? Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, very simply put, LLCs, as a non-corporate but business, private sector entity, can still create social change. Whatever they build into their mission, whatever their profit mechanism is, they can still create social change. And a 501c3 public charity can still make a profit. What happens is it depends on what they do with that profit. So if we're talking social enterprise or social entrepreneurship, Either one of these types of organizations, in addition to the L3C, can do that, right? So again, the foundering legislation that does not seem to be taking off in certain states, I think that that is one of the reasons that a lot of these lawmakers are saying, it's just not worth it to us. We can do these things that you're saying we can do with an L3C with our current existing structures. Let's not add another layer onto it. In terms of the purpose and mission, the question that was asked is, in recruiting and retaining employees, which aspect do you find applicants or staff most attracted? And again, it's tough because when you put in social impact, financial gain, or blended value, obviously your, your gut is going to tell you, you know, 46% say the ability to have both, 43% say social impact, right? So there obviously wasn't a large percentage that said, oh, we want to make a lot of money, right? That's not why they would go into this. Community and networks, have you found uh, nonprofit or for-profit organizations more receptive to your business model? Here's the breakdown. 22% um, nonprofit, 9% for-profit, 46% said equally responsive, 22% equally unreceptive or receptive. Those are the people I want to talk to next. Why are they unreceptive? If they're not instituting an L3C of their own, why are they against it? Okay. Funding, what percentage uh, of your revenue is received from private foundations? The mean percentage reported was 3%. And 53% of revenues came from business operations. So not a lot, but, but it's there. Um, assessment and accountability, does your L3C use a third party standard in evaluating its social impact? 58% uh, do not use a third party standard to evaluate social impact. That is sort of an underlining end note to this is in my opinion one of the perils of the L3C and other organizations that are not evaluating things. Again, putting in that sort of mechanism of accountability to ensure that there is some sort of social impact. So um, I, I believe 
I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I know that I tend to ramble sometimes, so if I glossed over something, I would be more than happy uh, over the next little bit to answer any questions. Um, if you would like to email for any of the materials uh, or the survey papers that I'm working on, you can get me at john.ronquillo at ucdenver.edu. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, off the top of my head, I can't remember where I found it, but I have both a PDF file and I want to say, you know, B-Lab might actually have one on their website. I'm not sure. Um, they have some pretty neat graphics. I don't want to sound like a spokesperson for them, but they do put, put together some things like that. Um, if you want to email, I'd be more than happy to follow up on that for you as well. Of course. What surprised you most about the results of the survey? Was it the last point, or, or were these in line with expectations ahead of time? You didn't really talk about <coughs> what you had it hypothesized. Yeah, I, well, once I got over the disappointment of the incredibly low response rate, <laughs> I, um, I was surprised. Um, I would say that that last point was very surprising and, and just disheartening. I figured that that would be something that they would really underline as if you're going to go for this new type of organizational form and you're using you know profit as a mechanism for social good then why wouldn't you demonstrate through some mechanism that, that, that you're achieving that but I'm not entirely surprised by that because you know other people said well the L3C is a good mark it's branding so if I've got the L3C behind my corporation it's just as good as a company that has the the B Corp, you know, uh, certification on there. But I had hoped that they would, but even B Corporations, or I'm sorry, because there is a difference between certified B Corporations and benefit corporations. Even they use standards like IRIS and some of the other things to show that they are doing what they intend to do. Um, and I think a lot, and I'm not sure if they're a B Corporation or not, I believe they're located here in LA. Um, Aspiration, a new financial institution, which has a very high yield checking, but in terms of the funds that they have, one of them is dedicated towards uh, impact investing. Um, and they tend to promise a, a good return on, on investment. And they produce their reports, and they have other reporting mechanisms as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by them as a financial institution, um, because I believe your accounts are also FDIC insured. And that sounds like it's one of the first Maybe not the first, but an initial one that, that protects those assets. So uh, to go back to your original question, Gary, I, I, that was one of the surprising ones. Uh, another surprising one was the extreme lack of minorities that are involved in L3Cs. Um, the proprietors uh, of those that did report back, uh, predominantly male and white, um, which does not really jibe with the rest of the social sector. Um, that tends to have a little bit more uh, diverse population and tends to, to lean a little bit more female. Um, so that was something that, that was surprising, but at the same time, if you look at the structure of, you know, typical business or corporate America, seems to merit mirror that. Um, trying to think of other data snapshots just from the top of my head. Well, the, the revenues didn't quite add up. 44% of the revenues you didn't specify, so 3% from Foundation, 53% of the business operations. Where's the other revenue coming? Oh, good question. I didn't include that. Is the 3% PRI going to be other grants? Uh, Jim, I do believe that is the case, actually. I will check. I'm happy to hand over the data, too, if you want. Um, I'm a sharer, so. So I have a question. Yes. Have, have you thought about just talking to private foundations and seeing if, even if they care about the organizational form? Most of my conversations are it's all about perform. Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, I talked, I, so I didn't do a lot of interviews. I did have some informational uh, interviews with folks at MacArthur in Chicago, and I would say that you're exactly right there. Um, one of the, the program officers was very pointed in saying, this isn't going to take off. Um, and, you know, we're going to invest in our PRI portfolio, but we don't really have any L3Cs that are high on our list right now. N nobody has approached us, and those who have, um, not nobody, but those who have approached us have not really um, struck a chord with us. 
I, I would have to say that this program officer um, was actually quite negative towards the idea of L3Cs surviving. Um, and so she didn't offer me much promise, to tell you the truth. Well, there, there are two affinity groups for sort of impact investing mm -hmm. that are sort of groupings of people in foundations. Mm -hmm. And you might talk to them and see if you can do a survey of the members of like mission impact investing networks sure. and local impact investing networks. And actually, Jim brings up a good point to your question, Gary, too, in terms of the question about um, the community and networks. I would say they were not well networked. So in terms of the communities that you're talking about where they might be able to leverage some knowledge within the foundation community, th those connections weren't there. So lots of cold calling, I'm assuming, which we know doesn't always yield the best results. Did that get at both of your questions? I'm, I'm going to dig for this. It was just an omission on my part for where the remainder is. But that's a really good question, Gary. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes? Uh, just looking at the data on the organizational structure, it seems that most of them are startups. Mm -hmm. And in a startup kind of a, in a startup structure, mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense as to the size of these organizations that have expanded? Uh, most of them are very small staffs. Um, some of them do employ some volunteers, which is not very common, just from the 70 that we were able to capture. But I would say most of them have uh, staffs of about 10 or fewer. So very small. So then that makes me wonder about the assessment and accountability, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Right. What is the cost of a third party evaluator? And if you're little and tiny, you just started, you don't have a sure. long history, why would yeah. you? No, that's an excellent question. and not. Again, to sound like a ravenous, tenure-hungry, younger professor, but I even offered, you know, some uh, no charge. If you have data, I would be more than happy to take a look and see where things are going for your organization. Um, I, I love doing surveys. I love doing interviews. I consider myself a mixed methods guy, and so if you want me to to reach out to your customer base or anything, I'd be more than happy to do that at no cost whatsoever. And this was primarily when I was in Chicago, and nobody took me up on it. I can understand. There probably was nothing. Yeah. And so, it, but I mean, you guys are also underlining a challenge of taking on research like this because, again, <laughs> in fighting a couple of these uh, manuscripts back in a submission, too, where some reviewers have said, is there really a there there? Are there reasons to be asking these questions? I think there are, again, because L3Cs tend to be a little bit more messy. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent point. There, there is a, a lot of startup mentality. But I will say also, with some of the demographics that have come back, the median age of the L3C proprietors is typically people who have had careers. It's, we're not seeing a lot of millennials, so to say, that are starting L3Cs. Um, it's, it's people who have definitely you know, had long work histories. So it could be interesting to the extent that people are interested. It's not necessarily my field of work, though I do know a lot of scholars that do focus on generational gaps within the social sector. Could be an interesting question to examine. Do you know the percentage that have, are no longer operating? I mean, low response rates, obviously, in this field, can happen that simple Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are a number that I know of that have folded an actual percentage I don't know. I know the tally that Rick keeps continues to grow. It hasn't decimated much since he started keeping the running, the running tally. And that's, that's the thing, is when you file your papers with the Secretary of State or whoever is you know, the charge of, of these organizations, um, I know that there are sometimes um, delays in, in showing who doesn't refile and whatnot. So the number has continued to grow, despite the fact that I know that there are some that don't exist anymore. Um, and not to throw our good public servants under the bus, but some of the record keeping uh, isn't done well, the redactions of the records, you know, things of that nature, I'm not entirely sure. That's a good thing to keep in mind. I do know, and Alex, since you spent time in North Carolina and are familiar with that community, um, I know that the existing L3Cs will stay there. You just can't incorporate, so they're grandfathered in. And it'll be an interesting thing 10 years down the road for people to see you know, an L3C in North Carolina, despite no new ones popping up. Are you seeing any patterns in terms of where the L3Cs locate and where they offer their services? I mean, the majority of them are locating in the states where they can register. So. Um, 
is, is that going to be? wondering even like in terms of demographics of the communities that they're locating in. Like are they are they drawn to more marginalized communities or or not? If I were to zoom out and look at my limited data as a whole, I would say um, not necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a, a bad thing. The ones that I was able to capture are really taking a look at some very niched areas. So some are focused on refurbishing housing as opposed to building new housing. They are refurbishing existing housing um, so as to not um, you know, clutter the landscape with new builds. They're, they're using existing infrastructure and providing low-income uh, families with housing opportunities. This was in particular an organization in Michigan, I believe, and hopefully I'm capturing the the crux of, of what it is that they do. So, you know, that one does focus on, you know, some communities that are at a disadvantage. There were the work skill building ones. So, I mean, I would say it's more focused on the need as opposed to any sort of demographic with regard to race or income. Um, so I don't know that it was necessarily targeted so much as we know that this exists. So we're hoping to cast a net and catch people who are able to take advantage of our services and we can help them in the long run. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. How much, um, they're, they're having trouble raising funds, and I wonder how much of it relative to the B Corp is the difference of being a corp versus an LLC, as opposed right. to some of the other, they're both novel forms, but if you're yeah. a B Corp, you can raise equity capital, mm -hmm. and that unlocks a lot of other financial instruments that can then invest in the company, even though uh, there isn't quite the same commitment to rewarding the shareholders to keep exactly. the money in the operation. Where an LLC, you know, I think about for-profit LLCs, they don't, they can't issue stock on a public market. They right. tend to be kind of medium-sized entities mm -hmm. to begin with. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, is the is the lack of incorporation itself what's holding this form back? That's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a very much a possibility. I mean, you outlined, you know, sort of where benefit corporations in B Lab has an edge, right, in terms of um, the certification and the raising of funds and things like that. I think that part of that might kind of come from where Mark Lane in Chicago is trying to expand the law so that it can be a little bit more fruitful and beneficial, like a, a benefit corporation. Um, because I, I just don't see the growth here. Um, I, I wanted to, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, again, as a social scientist, we wanna re remain relatively objective and examine these things. And, and there was a part of me that was saying, yeah, social good, let's do this. Uh, and I even wrote a foreword to one of Rick's white papers saying how you know, I, I thought this was something good. But um, again, over years, data as limited as mine is, um, is showing that there isn't that sort of attractive magnetic growth that, that these other organizations have. And you wish that there might be a mechanism where they could all cooperate and try and help each other because it's like, sure, we're all in this together, but at the same time, when you've got that mechanism where it's like, you know, they, some of these firms too are still saying, you know, we're a business and we're a business first and we're, you know, social impact secondarily. Whereas others, you know, especially L3Cs are trying to position it the other way around. We're trying to make the social impact first and then we're a business secondarily. One has to wonder, can you really sustain yourselves in that way? Um, and, and some of the, and this is reminding me of one of the questions that, that you asked earlier, Gary. Um, some of them were very pointed in saying, you know, we have to talk about our social impact so that we can maintain trust in our community but at the same time, we will not have a viable impact if we don't focus intently on our profits. So I, I hope that addressed your question, but you definitely illustrated a really keen uh, issue and disparity between the types of organizations. How much do you think the framing of like low profit has to do with it? So in terms of, I think, um, like I'm, I'm speaking in very broad generalizations, but broadly speaking, we kind of have cultural values of mm -hmm. Either you make as much money as you can, or you do as much good as you can for mm -hmm. nothing. So like kind of, you either charge a lot to be a lawyer, or you do pro bono work. Right. So how much do you think the situating low profit in between this binary of non-profit and yeah. for profit has to do Great thought. I, I, I think it's huge, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I, again, th this came out in interviews, showed you the representative quote, and I've had, I even had 
people counsel me, like, don't, don't say it long form, you know. Uh, it not only is L3C easier to say, but it does not capture what they're really trying to do. And I don't know why, you know, we, we, we use terms that don't necessarily capture what we do do. You know, I know there are people in the nonprofit field or the charitable field um, who say, well, let's stop calling them nonprofits. Let's call them community benefit organizations or social good organizations. And it's like you get so semantic about it that, that I, I remember reading a quote one time um, from a, uh, an individual I believe he was affiliated with the Reynolds program at NYU in their social enterprise area, who said, you know, quit trying to define what we're doing and let us just do it, right? That's tough. When you talk to people like us, we're social scientists. We want to define it. We need definitions before we go forward. But I absolutely think that despite the fact that there are some people who like that mark, saying, well, we're an L3C, we're a business, but we do business for social good, Again, when you bring that low profit in, I mean, there's, there's nothing in these statutes saying you can only take in 100 grand a year in profit. No, there's no benchmark. You can make a lot of money if you want to. And if you are successful in obtaining a PRI, uh, you can really make a lot of money. It's just we don't have a track record of consistency of organizations, you know, making a lot of money as a PRI or as, a, as an L3C. Isn't, our acronyms are the worst, just gets you so tongue tied. Um, but also the amount of capital that they're pulling in. So I would say it's modest. I think the potential is there, which is where the promise and the title comes in, but the history is what makes me worry. Very good point, though.